all the all the arguments that people are going to make on the basis of like the universal salvation of infants, they're all like inferences that you're drawing and they're not direct statements, right? They're, they're, I mean, they're basically all inferences that you're going to draw, but it seems like that God could, could have made this issue like crystal clear. He could have made it as crystal clear as he makes, you know, if you repent of your sins and believe the good news, you will be saved. Warning. The following message may be offensive to some audiences. These audiences may include, but are not limited to, professing Christians who never read their Bible, sissies, sodomites, men with man buns, those who approve of men with man buns, man bun enablers, white knights for men with man buns, homemakers who have finished Netflix but don't know how to meal plan, and people who refer to their pets as fur babies. Your discretion is advised. People are tired of hearing nothing but doom and despair on the radio. The message of Christianity is that salvation is found in Christ alone, and any who reject Christ therefore forfeit any hope of salvation, any hope of heaven. The issue is that humanity is in sin and the wrath of Almighty God is hanging over our heads. They will hear his words, they will not act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment, when the fires of wrath come, they will be consumed and they will perish. God wrapped himself in flesh, condescended, and became a man, died on the cross for sin, was resurrected on the third day, has ascended to the right hand of the Father, where he sits now to make intercession for us. Jesus is saying there is a group of people who will hear his words, they will act upon them, and when the floods of divine judgment come in that final day, their house will stand. Welcome to Bible Bash, where we aim to equip the saints for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask. We're your hosts, Harrison Kerrig and Pastor Tim Mullet, and today we're joined again by Pastor Conley Owens to help us answer the age-old question, do all babies really go to heaven when they die? Uh, and, and so obviously this is the part two uh, to the episode that we let out last week where we answered a, a pretty difficult question and, and one that we you know, all agreed is, is, is honestly pretty neglected throughout the evangelical world in general. It's just something that I think most even, even, you know, uh, faithful pastors really try and distance themselves from it because it's such a difficult uh, topic to talk about. It's so emotionally charged. And uh, towards the end of the last episode, we spent a lot of time sort of talking about some of the different arguments that we hear. Ba- Conley, basically, your position in all of this was that um, uh, some some babies go to heaven under extremely specific circumstances, but the reality is that most most babies who die, whether it you know whether it's uh, in the womb or you know three years old, five years old, what, whatever, whatever. Um, they, they don't just automatically go to heaven just because they're a child, right? That's correct. Yes. Yeah. And, and so, so that's your position and where we, towards the end of the last episode, we spent some time just talking about, Hey, what are some, what are some arguments, uh, that people give to try and prove that, that, that children actually do go to heaven. Right. And, and we're kind of given arguments that were coming from more of like a, a um, uh, Arminian sort of uh, understanding of the Bible, that that type of theology. And you know, the difficulty with that is just sometimes when you're when you're talking about an an Arminian uh, understanding of the Bible, it kind of feels like you're you're picking on your little brother a little bit, like. Like when you're refuting their arguments, it, it's just like there's just not much they're going to be able to do to really stop you. <laughs> they just there's not a whole lot there when it comes to uh, <laughs> when it comes to their understanding of, of some of these things. And so so that's probably not fair to do. Um, so I, I figured the better place to start this time would be like, all right, why don't we take some of the some of the guys from our own camp? Why don't why don't we pick on someone our own size here? 
uh, and and look at some of the things that they're. We're not they're, picking they're, on anyone. This is Conley. We're making. Conley. You're, you're right. You're right. Conley, it's time to pick on someone your own size, man. Um, uh, we, we 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 take no responsibility for this episode at all. This is this is all Conley. So so why don't why don't we look at some of those guys and say like, hey, what are what are they saying specifically about these things, and and what are our thoughts um, on their stances and and their explanations for why they think that uh, that children do go to heaven when they die. Because as we talked about last episode, Conley, and you, you pointed this out a few times, um, even, even Reformed Christians, most Reformed Christians think this way, right? And so, so why don't we start there? Uh, and, and Conley, uh, just you know, give us some of the things that you've heard uh, Reformed guys say, and then and let us know your thoughts on them. Sure. Yeah, I mean, we can start off with the objection that because Romans 5, 13 through 14 says that uh, for sin was indeed in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. That because uh, the children don't know the law yet, uh, they can't be held accountable to the law. There's no sin imputed to them. So sure, they may have sinned, but they're not held guilty on account of that sin because the, the sin is not imputed to them. So that's that's uh, one that I've heard occasionally. Mm-hmm. The thing is, in context, there, it's talking about people's recognition of the law. It, it's talking about why God gave the law, and Paul talks about in uh, Romans seven how uh, without the command to not covet, he wouldn't have known, you know, the depth of his sin. And so God God gives the law so that we will recognize it because, as it says in Romans 1, we're suppressing the truth and unrighteousness. So none of this, when it's talking about imputing sin or imputing uh, guilt, well, it speaks of sin specifically. When it talks about imputing sin, it's not saying that God does not impute sin to us. He doesn't count us as sinners as if we don't know. Rather, mm-hmm. it's saying that man doesn't consider himself a sinner without the law being made clear to him while he's suppressing his truth, that truth and unrighteousness. Right. So I think that's the primary thing that's going on there is people count that imputation. You know, there's a lot of times theological words are used in the Bible or words that we have adopted as part of our you know systematic theologies and people read them with those definitions. So you see impute. And you immediately think, okay, that's talking about God crediting this right. sin to yeah. someone. You know, a good example of that would be justification, right? The Bible uses the word justification a lot. We've got a pretty good definition of that, of being made James right with two. God. Yeah, but then you come to James 2, and suddenly justification's not being used exactly in the same way, right? And so if you if you take that word justification and think that we're using a textbook definition of it every single time— uh, you're going to end up being confused, and the same is true with the word impute. The same same thing happens with sanctification in general, or a lot. Of, I mean, almost all the all the Westminster theological terms at various points uh, are suffering from the same kind of problem. That if you read those terms as 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 if they're uh, terminus technicus or you know technical terms, in every instance you're going to be led astray. So right. Yeah, problem. the Bible's the Bible's not a textbook. I mean, it gives us everything we need, but it's not a it's not written as a textbook so that each word always means the exact same thing. Well, and that's that's something that people, um, you know, just in terms of word study fallacies in general as they're approaching the Bible, a, a lot of people are making those kind of mistakes um, where they think that any time a you know a Koine Greek word shows up, it's going to show up in the same way in every single instance, and that's just simply not the way that language works. Uh, you know, you can just think about a word like trunk in English and you ask yourself, well, what is the meaning of the word trunk? And it's like, well, I have no idea. <laughs> it depends. You know, you're talking about an elephant or a tree or a car or, you know, something you carry something in and you just have no idea. And it, But people frequently make that kind of assumption with um, language in general. And, and that betrays kind of just a lack of sophistication as to how language works. But what, are, what other objections you have? Yeah, I'll throw in there that I had someone in a Bible study recently that was trying to, you know, pull out lexicons on me. And this is a this was a Bible study that wasn't part of a um, it wasn't in a church setting. It was in a work setting. So they didn't know how much familiarity I have with Greek, which is frankly not that much. But I have taken multiple Greek classes. I'm in my third Greek class at this point. And, you know, they're making a lot of the arguments that you're describing. And I'm, I'm trying to explain that's that's not how you do this. 
they, right, they were, right. yeah, it, it's hard to get it through to people. A lot of times you can't just, you can't just look at words that way. You know, it's, what, what is the Amplified Bible that gives you a list of all the possible range of meanings and then people just go through that and pick the one they want at any given time. Yeah. Or they include all of them, right? That's right. another thing is, yeah. you know, I, I once heard a preacher uh, preach on um, how there was something where it said, this is a good word. And he looked at all the definitions for Kalos, you know, yeah. and just imported all of them into the meaning. You know, it's just a standard Greek word for good, but, you know, he made it mean everything the word good can yeah. possibly mean. And every context. Well, people do that with Ecclesiastes too, with the word, you know, um, uh, for vanity at that point where they import in, into that word, every single sense of the word that can possibly be. And you know, that is, it's a problem, but anyways, continue. Go ahead. Uh, one more objection that people often make is that, uh, they look at the words of Ezekiel and the words of Jeremiah, where it talks about people saying that our fathers ate sour grapes and our teeth are set on edge and that, it shouldn't be the case that the sins of the fathers are visited on the children. Well, first of all, I think it's important to observe that in the very next chapter of Jeremiah, it says, you show steadfast love to thousands, but you repay the guilt of the fathers to their children after them. So that language coming from the second commandment, talking about sins being visited on subsequent generations, the consequences of sins, and the same thing with good deeds, Right, those who are righteous, the effects of their righteousness uh, having ripples effect, ripple effects to thousands of generations after them. Given that Jeremiah speaks of these things in context of a new covenant that God is giving, I think the right way for us to understand this is not that it's saying that there are never consequences on children uh, given their parents' actions, but rather that. Uh, anytime a child repents, anytime any person repents, uh, God is faithful to honor that repentance. But anytime someone continues in sin, following as their parents have sinned, then uh, they will suffer sin as well. they will suffer the judgment on sin as well. Now, when it comes to original sin, you know, well, that's Adam's where it's sin, a weird. That's that's where it's a weird objection coming from, like reform people. It's a, it's weird in that. Reformed people should have a doctrine of original guilt. And so if you have a doctrine of original guilt, then you're basically putting this argument forward. This is basically a Pelagian argument. So it know. really is. Yeah. And so we're talking about generational retribution. We're talking about consequences. These are not talking about original sin, right? They're not talking about the covenantal imputation of guilt given Adam's sin, you know, if you throw that away, like I said last time, you're throwing away also the imputation of Christ's righteousness because it's that same mechanism of being counted in Adam or being counted in Christ, whereby, uh, you know, we have salvation. Yeah. Now, uh, from Reformed folks um, who are trying to maintain some sort of notion of original guilt as it relates to this uh, topic and you know if you're not familiar with those terms original guilt is just the idea that uh, we inherit not only just a sinful um, orientation as a result of Adam's sin but we actually uh, inherit the actual guilt of that act and that's obviously demonstrated in the fact that we all die <laughs> um, you know it's the point that a man wants to die and after that's judgment uh, we live in a fallen world there's obviously entailments of Adam's and Adam's act in the garden. Uh, but, you know, as I'm saying, a lot of um, reformed people, they will basically try to adopt some sort of hybrid view as it relates to this, the, the imputation of Adam's guilt. Uh, I was reading through uh, Jesse Johnson's uh, article on, um, let's see if I can figure out what the name of that was. Uh, what happens to infant when they die? He had a series on that and he gave Old Testament answers and New Testament answers. But one of the things that he was mentioning essentially is that um, it's almost some sort of hybrid position there where infants can inherit the guilt of Adam's sin only as it relates to kind of the temporal, but then not as it relates to the eternal uh, consequences of that. So what kind of response would you give to that kind of reformed objection? Right. Yeah. And I I don't know how explicitly he said that too, but it, that seems to be the implication of what he's saying that, yeah, there are, there are consequences for your, for being a sinner temporally, even as an infant, but, but not eternally. Um, 
yeah, why, why would it be right if God treats children as innocent, as truly innocent in light of eternal judgment, why would it be right for him to, uh, to take their life early at all? Why would it be right for anyone to suffer if they are innocent? You know, if you come into this world innocent, why should you ever be subject to suffering? The only or pain. Yeah, or pain, right? The only the only person who ever suffered innocently was Jesus Christ, and he did so voluntarily. You know, he chose to be sent by his father and and suffer pain in this world. Uh children and everyone who grows up in this world, uh, the reason why we suffer pain is because we are indeed sinful. It is because of our guilt before God, even as infants. Well, that's what's so weird about the objection. So that that kind of objection, um, you know, if you take that principle, like the children should never suffer from the father's choices, and you turn it into like if you absolutize it, you bring it bring it all out to the end. Like there's no like if that's like if that's true, then there, like it seems like you like if you, <laughs> you have no mechanism for saying that children should ever die, should ever be sick, should ever suffer, should have any pain. Uh, if that's what those passages are saying, um, it, you, it, it doesn't seem to make sense to try to carve out just a special exception as it relates to eternal things, but not as it relates to temporal things. But do you have any other thoughts related to that? No, I, I think that's exactly right. Yeah. God doesn't set up those distinctions. Um, yeah. Every, yeah. Every sin deserves God's wrath and curse, both in this life and in the one to come. Uh, so that's if were, if that's were, the uh, Westminster Shorter Catechism right there. So the, yeah, it, it is the case that all sin, and that includes Adam's sin that's imputed to us, that is credited to us. So if you're trying to make that uh, some sort of carve out at that point, do you consider that to be a denial of the doctrine of original guilt? I do, yes. And yeah, I get that people are inconsistent and they still want to hold on to that, but it is it is implicitly a denial. Why, why, maybe you can elaborate. Why is, is it, why is it, implicitly a denial because uh, like, if are you, you not allowed to make the w- w- what if someone were to say hey you just it's i believe in original guilt i'm just being nuanced right <laughs> well <laughs> if you believe in original guilt that is so powerless that god wouldn't actually hold it against you in a court of law you know what what does it even mean like what is guilt at that point if if you can't be counted guilty in court on account of it like right. it's just not guilt anymore I don't know what else you call it, but <laughs> <laughs> what else do you have, Gunley? Like uh, reform objections that you? Yeah, well, I mean, a, a related one to that one that you just mentioned. Uh, it's it's been said by some, or at least one, <laughs> that uh, we're saved by grace, but damned by works, right? Or judged, or judged on the basis of our works. So you see all these passages in Scripture that talk about um, God's judgment on judgment day being according to the works that we've done in the body, whether good or evil. And so a lot of people will look at that and they'll say, okay, so I get that there's this thing about original sin, but that original sin never comes up on judgment day, right? We're only judged according to our works. And if children don't have evil works, then they're, they're free here in this regard. I I just don't, I I just don't get that at all. I mean, I I know I said this last time, but I don't understand how anyone who has been around children can look at children and say, "Yep, there is no sin there." You know? I mean, uh, even in the even um like in the womb, right? Like, I mean, they're having thoughts. Now they're now are they the same kind of thoughts that, you know, we're having as fully fully developed adults? Probably not, but they are having thoughts and the reality is that they are human. They are human in the womb. And, and, um, and so, you know, and apart from faith, thoughts are sinful. Right. Right. And, and so I don't know how you look at all of that and spell that out. Conley. Yeah. So, uh, Hebrews 11, six says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. Romans 14, 23 says that anything that does not proceed from faith is sin. So if you have, if you have thoughts that are not, uh, that, you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about your world around you. Even if your world around you is very small, it's just the just the encasing around you in the womb. <laughs> it, it's still the case that those thoughts are supposed to honor God by recognizing him as above all things. And the Bible tells us that our natural state is to not honor him as God. And therefore, even a child's very small thoughts 
are sinful in the eyes of God because they are not honoring God as God. And I, I want to point out too, that I think it, it seems like uh, re- the re- reformed Christian, their, their understanding of whether or not children are sinful is not consistent. Like it seems like some people are saying uh, they're not, they're just not sinful. And then it seems like there's another portion of this camp that's saying, well, they are sinful, right? And, and they're probably feeling the tension that you're bringing up, Conley. Um, so they are sinful, but then they don't either. The explanation is either, you know, they're only sinful as far as they've inherited from Adam, right? Or they're sinful in their own actions as well as what they've inherited from Adam. Uh, but then they don't know that they're sinful. And so because they don't know they're sinful, then they can't be held accountable for those things. And that kind of get, gets us back into the whole, you know, um, sin is what, not imputed where there is no right. Law, right. right? And, and, and I know, I understand we already talked about that, but I, I'm more just trying to make the distinction is not only do I not understand how anyone, anyone can say, Hey, kids aren't sinful, but then it seems like even reformed Christians who like all, you know, out of all of the reformed Christians who don't believe that who, who believe that children go to heaven, all of them, they don't even agree on whether or not children are sinful or not. Uh, and, and so it, it's, that's pretty concerning. You know, if you're talking about like, Hey, where do they go for eternity? And, and you can't even agree on, are they sinful or not? And, and, I've been I've been kind of flabbergasted. I you you didn't mention the names, you know, of of <laughs> the people who are saying some of these things, but I I have been I mean just kind of flabbergasted at the people at, at who it is that say you know yeah. saying some of these things. Yeah, it's up to you whether or not you want to mention names, but these are these are people that you would not expect to be saying these things. Absolutely not. Not when no no. Um, but yeah, I I, I guess I won't say them right now, but um. It is. It isn't. It, it's very um, jarring. I guess. Yeah, yeah. So one of the things that um, Jesse Johnson in that uh, article I mentioned was saying. <laughs> Tim, was, Tim's like, yeah. Anyways, Jesse Johnson. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I'm, I'm, I'm responding to you. Up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The. Uh, I'm happy to mention names. <laughs> but, but one of the things he was saying is he's basically saying it's not that they're not sinful. Uh, children are not sinful there, but they fall into sin like you might fall into gravity is kind of his point. So they fall into sin like they might fall into gravity, whereas adults, when they sin, it's heavy handed. Yeah. It, so that's basically the distinction they're making. So they don't they, it's not that. Um, um, yeah, you've got the intentional sins and you've got, the you know, the high handed sins. and Right. Yeah, so what, yeah. what's your response? Why don't, why to that don't we just thing? call them mortal and venial while we're at it? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah, for anyone who doesn't get that, those are the Roman Catholic distinctions. Um, yeah, and that's and that's essentially what this comes down to. You're going to start making distinctions between sins in this way. And uh, I mean, you all had an episode recently. You all recognize that some sins are more heinous than others. But that doesn't mean that uh, there are some sins that deserve death and other sins that don't deserve death. Like, they all deserve death. And we just, yeah, we just, uh, to round this out a little— you know, yeah, we've said that this episode and last that actual sins are happening far earlier than people imagine, you know, most likely in the womb as the child's having thoughts. And uh, but even if you didn't have that, if you have guilt, Adam's guilt that we have and we, we must bear, but you don't make that a guilt that can make you guilty in court. It's not real guilt. Like it doesn't it doesn't have any meaning. And in this this example with Jesse Johnson, this seems like a case where you have this doctrine of original corruption so that someone is, um, is orientated towards sin, like you said, but not, but not in a way that that orientation itself is such a corruption that God would count it as guilt or that Adam's sin is counted towards you. So there's just, there's three types of guilt here that are not being counted. Right. Well, and that's what, um, the only way that that makes sense, again, you know, even though they're reformed, like the only way that that makes sense to me is if 
you're treating sin only as if it's some sort of volitional act of a libertarian free will or something along those lines. <laughs> so, like that's yeah. the, that's the assumption that seems to undergird that kind of project, right? To say that right. you can be oriented towards sin, but it doesn't count unless you know you have like knowledgeable, intentional, volitional, yeah. high-handed rebellion. But then, I mean, it doesn't really pass. Um, the smell test as far as that goes. And it doesn't really feel very you know, Calvinistic, but <laughs> yeah, it's only when you're like pushing the boundaries beyond your total depravity or something. I, yeah, it, it really doesn't make sense. All right. So what else you have Conley? Yeah. Conley, so, I, I know you're holding back, man. I, I know you're holding back <laughs> and based off of what, what we were talking about before we started, started recording. I, I know you're holding back. So yeah. So my favorite one, my favorite one, I'll, I'll read this quote. This is from another uh, thinker who I won't name. Uh, Sam Storms. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to say it just because I didn't. I didn't know he said it. So, but Tim, Tim is like so, throw him right under there. <laughs> throw him right under so, there. <laughs> okay, so he qualifies this. He go. He goes ahead and says he he recognizes this is the subjective <laughs> argument. However, he goes ahead and makes the argument. And he says, given our understanding of God's character as presented in Scripture. Does he appear as the kind of God who would eternally condemn infants on no other ground than infant election of Adam's transgression or Adam's transgression? Uh, again, this is subjective and perhaps in the mental question, but it deserves an answer nonetheless. So, so my response is it doesn't deserve an answer. It deserves a rebuke. You know, this is the kind of thing where Paul would say, who are you, O oh man, to answer back to God? We don't get to make God in our image, you know, and say, is God really the kind of God that would do this? You know, I think he'd be more like me and, and give a free pass to, to these, um, to these little infants. Uh, this is, uh, I feel like this is a very dangerous way of thinking about scripture and, in so many other categories, you know, we are very ready to say, Hey, you can't think about this in terms of your feelings. You've got to think about this in the terms of what scripture actually says. And he says, okay, but, you know, we know God is love. So let me take my picture of love and describe to you what I think it should look like. You know, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's a very backwards way of considering what God's actions are. Yeah. And, and I think that's kind of what, what has been so jarring for me is, um, one of the things that I appreciate so much about, uh, many of the reform, reformed Christian teachers out there is, you know, their willingness on so many other topics to say, Hey, look, it doesn't matter how we feel when, you know, when we're, when we're reading the Bible, it doesn't matter how we feel. It matters what the Bible says, because we know that God's word is true. And we know that ultimately God's ways are higher than our ways, right? I mean, who, you know, who could counsel God? certainly not man, you know, his wisdom far exceeds our own. And, and, and it's not even, it's not even close to close, you know, and, and, and that's what I've appreciated so much about reformed Christians in general, um, which is why it's so jarring to see them <laughs> kind of completely throw that out the window. And I mean, it really, do, it really does seem like uh, a, the, the guys who who do think that all babies go to heaven, it really, if you could just take some of their quotes, you know, like I said on the last episode that I had read, um, that I had been reading through the book that John MacArthur wrote. Um, I, I, I still can't, I still can't remember the name of it. I, um, safe like, in the arms of God. Safe, safe, yeah. safe in, the, yeah, safe in the arms of God. And, and, um, you know, I think it, you could probably just take some of those quotes, some of the quotes out of that book and just cover up the name, you know, who, who said it. And you really, you really couldn't tell it apart from, a, you know, like a charismatic, you know, um, like person trying to interpret the Bible. Right. And, and even looking, I'm looking at this, um, uh, this Jesse Johnson article. And I think I'll probably just end up linking this to the episode so people can look at it themselves too. But even, even just looking at this, this Jesse Johnson article, uh, you know, point, um, point four says God refers to children. This is an argument for why children, uh, go to heaven. If, if they die, God refers to children and pagan families who are murdered 
as innocence in uh, Jeremiah chapter 19, verse four. Uh, and that, I mean, that just sounds like a poor, like just, just reading that one sentence sounds like a, you know, this looks like, like, um, I mean, I don't, I hesitate to say this, but it really does look like the same exact sort of hermeneutical approach that you would see like a prosperity gospel teacher take to try and prove that, you know, that the, the promises made to Israel and the old Testament apply to Christians and apply to Christians in the exact same way. I mean, I was, I was <laughs> Tim, when he you showed the me this head, article, not the tail. <laughs> yeah. And, 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 and Tim showed me this article and I, you know, I was scrolling through it, kind of skimming through all these points. I think there's like, what, how many are there here? 16. And at the very bottom, it's a, I didn't know who wrote it. He just, he just sent it to me and I was reading it. And, um, at the very bottom, it said the master seminary. And I was just, I was like, what this is, this is coming <laughs> from the master seminary. Are you kidding me? I mean, this is like, you can read point by point and, and refute these instantly, you know? And, and, and so I think, I think that's kind of what's disappointing. And, and I say all that just to say, it really does seem like for whatever reason, when it comes to this topic, this is the topic that even for, uh, even for reformed Christians, you are just simply not allowed to read the Bible and understand the Bible and take the Bible for what it says Instead, you are supposed to be for, informed uh, primarily by your emotions, right? And because, because obviously, like, who wants to think about uh, uh, children, you know, who didn't even get a chance because their mothers hated them so much that they went and, you know, they, they sought out an abortion and murdered their baby in the womb, and now that baby is in hell, right? And, I mean, no one wants to think about that, but then the reality is, like that's what's happening, you know, for, or at least like for, um, you know, at least for, uh, most, you know, most babies, right. According to what the Bible is saying. And, and so no one wants to think about that, but then the reality is that's what, I mean, that's just how all this works. You know, it, it, it's hard to, it's hard to imagine that there is some sort of age of accountability or, you know, um, it's, it's hard to imagine that children just don't sin now apparently you know i i can't wrap my head around these things and really it is it is quite surprising i i feel like we should just play a game sometime where it's like take the quote from the reformed guy <laughs> and and black out the name and you know guess who said this you know and, and <laughs> i don't think i think i think yeah, yeah reformed exactly. arminian i think we would all fail probably. <laughs> but we reformed yeah I, so look at that if you look at arminian books on this topic like uh, i believe his name is adam hargrave he has one and you know, very Pelagian, but then, uh, you know, I read the books from Calvinist thinkers and it's, uh, same you know, they're making up, the same, same arguments. Argument. Yeah. I was, it's wild. Was, was something you brought up Harrison that, that will transition into something I wanted to ask uh, Conley about here. Uh, so, you know, Harrison, your operating assumption is that, um, you know, the weight of scripture would lead us to be very pessimistic about the reality that, um, very many infants at all would be saved. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, uh, Conley, you're making a case, uh, not just like for agnosticism at this point. So like meaning like you're making a case, um, like you, you can make different kinds of cases here. So, you know, in terms of my own posture towards this issue, I'm kind of, I, I would be more, I think in, um, you know, uh, agnostic middle ground than probably both of you here. <laughs> <laughs> and I got more like a principled agnostic on this question, meaning like if I'm, if I, if you force me to defend like the universal salvation of infants, I'm going to just say, I, I can't make it work. You know, I can't, I can't go there. Um, and then, you know, as I'm reading the Bible, it seems like there's so many, um, positive passages that I can go to about the nature of salvation and the exclusivity of salvation that, you know, I, I'm going to have a very hard time. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to have a very hard time defending um, the position of universal salvation of infants. I don't, I don't think the Bible teaches that at all. Uh, but then, um, you know, if you ask me to say, you know, make the case on the other end, I'm going to, I'm going to be a little more tentative about it, but both of you are very confident. Okay. 
but, but the, <laughs> but I'm more agnostic. I'm more in the middle, but then. So, but so the, when you say, when you say agnostic, you mean maybe, maybe all infants are saved, that all infants dying in infancy are saved. It's possible you just couldn't show it from scripture. Yeah, I'm I'm happy to be surprised, you know. <laughs> okay. Yeah, or or um like, you know, that's um that's a possibility that they all I mean, in my mind it could, you know, maybe maybe it could be that that's just a surprise or something. Um that if there is like a concept of an elect infant, so to speak, right? So if you say, "Hey, there's a concept of an elect infant," then then maybe I just okay, maybe 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 they're maybe they're all elect, you know. God just decided to elect them all. Um, I'm open to that possibility. I don't think it's likely, but I'm open to it. I'm more adopting kind of a middle ground posture, but then Conley, you're, you're going further than that. And you're saying, um, then Harrison, right. you're definitely, you're definitely going further than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I am. You're, you're, <laughs> you're, you're saying, um, you're saying, no, that would be unbiblical to expect a high percentage of infants. So we need to adopt more of a, a, um, it's probably, probably not hardly any of them kind of posture. Yeah, I'm not going to uh, make too strong statements about ratios, but certainly, yeah, I think there's 100%. Less than more. There's a, yeah, it's less than all of them, definitely. Less than, but you would say probably few do, right? You're saying oh, few. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah. At the but, very at that least, point, but at that one point, I'm speaking less confidently. Oh, okay. All right. All right. So you, all right, but go ahead and make your case. Why? Um, so what, yeah, so what the, would push you over from like a just, uh, hey, the Bible doesn't say, and I, and I'm, uh, I think that the Bible says things on the opposite, which should encourage pessimism. I'm just, um, you know, it may be just, I'm emotionally just saying, um, adopt a middle ground, neutral posture, here. <laughs> but what would push you over to be more pessimistic about it? More pessimistic? I'm, uh, I'm, I'm not sure. I mean, you'd have to have a positive statement from scripture about, about these ratios. That certainly would help, <laughs> but no, I, no, but I, you're making a case that universal salvation of infants is not tr- biblical. So make that right. case. What is the case that that's yeah. not right? So, so the, I, I, I can make it, I could just say, Hey, it doesn't say that. So you, I can't be confident about it, but you're right. saying, no, it doesn't say that you're going the right. next step. It doesn't say that. So make that case. Right. So if you, uh, which I'm inclined to agree on your case, I, I'm, yeah. I'm inclined to agree. Yep. For, for, for those listening in and haven't listened to the last episode, I would recommend zooming in all the way to the, the end where I summarize my case based on the doctrine of election. I think that the doctrine of election, uh, as presented in scripture, just absolutely disallows for the salvation of all infants, particularly because, uh, one, if all infants dying in infancy were saved, then it would no longer be the case that God is choosing the few rather than the many. Um, and we we talked about some statistics on that, but the the scripture is clear that that not many not the majority of people are saved rather there's a few there's a narrow door and also that man can't manipulate god and election and there are a lot of people who believe this and you believe specifically that all infants dying in infancy are saved and if that's the case they can manipulate god's election by uh by killing someone by killing an infant and Basically, these things that scripture says are absolutely not true would become true in the case that all infants are elect, all infants dying in infancy are elect. Those things being that, um, that there are, the Bible says that the way to life is narrow and, and few will find it. And that's a percentage, right? As a percentage. Right. And if right. so many babies are dying in miscarriages, then essentially we're throwing off the percentages that are found there. Right? Yeah, so, exactly. And, so it can't be then, all of them because that would over that would tip the scales, right? Right, absolutely. And then the the even stronger one is that man cannot force God's hand just by natural means. But this is something where we would have natural means by which we could determine the election of of someone. Well, I wonder, you know, related to that issue because I've talked with people who disagree on this topic, and you know, I've listened to the episode and weren't persuaded. Uh, but then one of the points I brought up as it related to that very topic is that. Like it, it seems to me that, you know, it's very hard to prove that they would all like the, like all the, all the arguments that people are going to make on the basis of like the universal salvation of infants, they're all like inferences that you're drawing and they're not direct statements, right? They're, they're, I mean, they're basically all inferences that you're going to draw, but it seems like that God could, could have made this issue like crystal clear. He could have made it as crystal clear as he makes 
you know, if you repent of your sins and believe the good news, you will be saved. And how will they hear unless they um, have a, you know, a preacher and and all that, right? And like the gospel to power, God and salvation, all that. I mean, you have like crystal clear statements in the Bible of how you get saved and the exclusivity of salvation and how that works. But there doesn't seem to be anything comparable as it relates to the salvation of infants. But then it seems to me that if that was presented with absolute crystal clear clarity, uh, clarity, people would abuse it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's true. It's I mean, and you have cult. You have. I mean, I'm sure you've had like uh, like some throughout church history. You know. Uh, postpartum mother who has determined that, uh, you know, this world's an evil place and she wanted to spare her children from, you know, all the pain that's coming and, you know, uh, drowned them in the bathtub or something like that. And so, but, but then it seems to me that there's some, um, if this is, uh, this isn't the kind of thing that maybe God would reveal. Maybe (laughs) if, if he could tell you a way to work the system, we're sinful enough that we would we would work it. We'd you know? try. <laughs> yeah. We, we would try. So, you know, I wonder if maybe that, that you know, if, if there is something like that, you know, would, would God even reveal it? <laughs> sure. So you're, you're suggesting that maybe it's true and the, there's a reason why God didn't make it explicit in scripture. Maybe it's true that all infants dying in infancy are saved. Well, I mean, it seems like if he wanted to make that, make that, if that was, if that was mm-hmm. something he wanted us to know, it seems like we would, right. we would abuse it to our heart's content. And so, you know, I can understand why it wouldn't be revealed, but I don't actually think it's, I don't think it's right. <laughs> okay. right. right. Yeah. I don't think yeah. it's right, but I mean, it's just, it's not the kind of thing that you would, um, yeah. Yeah. Like uh, here's a, how you game the system guys, you know, just kill them all, you know. <laughs> There's a very similar question around whether those who, you know, grow up on an Island, never hear the gospel, whether or not they'll be right. saved. Right. Yeah. And a very common evangelical answer to that is, oh, you know, if they were never given a chance, yeah, of course they'll go to heaven. Oh, this is even what C.S. Lewis more or less says in, um, in mere Christianity. Uh, and so I've heard people say, well, you know, if that were the case, we shouldn't send missionaries. We should send wall building teams around the islands so that the gospel <laughs> never gets to them. And they, ne- they never hear the gospel. And well, be held accountable. A, yeah, it seems strange the- that Jesus would say, hey, go and make disciples of all the nations. If you know, if that means that's just going to increase their guilt the whole time. <laughs> well, I mean, and then Paul, you know, makes that very case, like that the reason why we like they're not going to hear unless someone is sent. Right. So we need to send people, which seems to close that door. And, and I would say that like the same kind of closing the door happens here. But I don't think many people are actually all that confident of it. Um, you know, and this is something I brought up too. Like, I don't think anyone's really like ab- anyone on the other side. I don't know that they're absolutely confident of it. So, I mean, think about this way, and I, I want you to critique this kind of line of reasoning constantly. I mean, if someone really believed that they could kill some kill a baby and the baby would automatically go to heaven, like, isn't that like the ultimate like self-sacrifice? And isn't that the ultimate like selflessness? And like, I mean, like if you could if you could damn yourself for eternity in order to save all of your family, like why not do it, right? Like in, 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 are you selfish for not doing it? Um, like, uh, but then I don't know that anyone actually believes it. Right. Uh, so the person I was talking with, you know, as it related to this point, I would say, well, if you really believe it, like if you really believe and they, they, you know, they're like, I think it's more probable than not. I'm like, but if you really believed it, wouldn't you just go ahead and, you know, take them out? You know, he's like, well, no, I'm not going to hell for them. <laughs> <laughs> But I mean, I mean, <laughs> yeah, but, but yeah, we talked about this last time, what Paul says in Romans nine, you know, that he would, he would gladly give up his own soul for the sake of his, for the sake of his people, but he can't like, it's just not something that we can do. Um, but, but know, I mean, we if can't. we believe that, if you believe that, is that morally wrong not to? Right. That's yeah, my exactly. question. It, it is. It, it does put you in a moral paradox of sorts where, you know, the thing that is most beneficial to other people would actually be uh, sinful. And so, yeah, it just goes against, you know, everything that we see about self-sacrificial ethics in scripture. So it's, uh, yeah, it's an odd one. I I guess if there's any response to that, it's like, well, um, I need to be like, uh, you know, I'm I'm picking on it, but I mean, I guess the other side could say, well, we love God first, right? And then we love our neighbor second and you have to keep these things <laughs> <Yeah>. in priority. <laughs> so as much as, uh, you know, um, like me dishonoring right. God is worse than me like, sacrificing for my neighbor. So right. we'll, give them, we'll I, give them a way out. 
Yeah, I think the I don't think it, people are usually thinking that clearly about it. And if that's if that's their answer, they probably often don't act in accord with that in other circumstances right. where you give them moral gray areas. You're so right, it's, sure. Yeah, it's uh I, I think people just aren't thinking consistently on this. It's very easy to not think consistently on it and you 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 kind of have to in order to basically there's some cognitive dissonance going on and you just have to preserve it as best you can by trying to keep these two truths far apart that God says certain things about salvation, but I really want all the little bitty babies to go to heaven. All right. Well, let the little children come to me. What? Come on. Yeah. Jesus is like little kids. So what do you got, man? <laughs> Jesus loved the kids. He wanted the kids to come. And then of heaven, you know, heaven um, would be filled with, you know, um, such as these, right? So what do you got? Right. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so aren't the, all the little kids going to heaven? Uh, Mark and Luke, uh, expand on what Matthew says. And he says, truly, I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a little child shall not enter it. So Ari, you have a statement that we have to, we have to receive the kingdom of heaven like a little child. So analogy is being made to a child. And what is that? Like, it's not their ignorance. It's, it, God's not commending ignorance. You know, he's commending trust. And so we're to, to trust like a child trusts, but the child isn't necessarily trusting in God or in the kingdom of God. So, you know, making an analogy from one kind of trust to another kind of trust is not saying that children have the kind of trust that actually save. It's just that they have a very similar kind of trust that we are to emulate. It's just a picture. It's just a picture of what trust looks like. All right. Well, related to that, then um, a question I did have. So you, uh, Conley, you, you articulated a um, category for infant salvation. So there, there, it could be that um, there are some elect in- infants. Uh, I think you mentioned David, or John the Baptist, um, Jesus, obviously. Uh, well, uh, yeah, it's it? different because he's not safe yeah. from anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, All right, so I caught it. I caught it after be, I said it. Yeah. yeah, but there does seem to be some supernatural um, assistance in his human nature to to his faith, given the words of Psalm twenty two. All right. So what what does infant faith like look like? So like I think this is a hang up for people. Um, I mean, you, you know, it, it's not as if an infant can pray a prayer or walk an aisle or right. ask Jesus into her heart. Right. Raise their hand, you know. Raise their hand. <laughs> Nod. <laughs> uh, yeah. I see that hand. <laughs> I see that. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if, um, if you, um, if you hear me blink, you know, uh, three times, <laughs> and I see that blink. Uh, all right. So, but the. Uh, child can't do any of any of those things right. and so what what does salvation or what does faith look like um because most of the typical you know ways we understand these things are not uh, parallel here yeah so it's worth calling out that uh one of the arguments i made last time was that there's no such thing as this as a faithless justification you know that faith is a sole instrument of justification we are only made right with god uh through faith and uh we need to have if a child is saved in infancy, it is, it is through faith. Now, most of the people that I have heard who take my position don't actually, don't actually say this. Or, and I don't know. I haven't heard that many people who also hold my positions talk about this. So maybe it's not that many of a sampling, uh, not that large of a sampling size that I have to go with. But a lot of people uh, believe that, yeah, not all infants dying in infancy are saved, but some are. And, they import them into heaven without without any kind of justification or faith that that's all happening post mortem. So I think it's worth pointing that out. But what does what does this uh, infant faith look like? First of all, I think it's important to recognize in Scripture that you have saving faith in the Old Testament that does not look like knowing exactly who Jesus is or that he dies on the cross or that he's resurrected, right? Because you have all kinds of people who are putting their trust in a Messiah without knowing all those details. Galatians 3 talks about the gospel preached beforehand to Abraham, and he doesn't have all those details. The gospel is initially given in Genesis 3.15. And you have, if you walk through the next couple of chapters and you see the way people name others, whenever those names are explained, like Noah, this is the one who will give us rest, or even Eve, that she would be the mother of all the living, it shows that people have an anticipation of of salvation through the Son. So that's just kind of a setup to say that what we think of of necessary saving faith right now, like, you know, you need a whole creed, that is not what saving faith has looked like throughout the history of 
of humanity. So that gives us some room to realize that, okay, saving faith doesn't have to be as developed as we think of it. And so what saving faith would look like for a child is, yes, it would require God giving them uh, miraculously some special ability to understand their sin, some special ability to understand their need for a Savior, and some special ability to understand that a, a Savior will be given. Um, so it's not something that a child can have naturally, but uh, it just doesn't have to be as developed as we might think of it. So it it looks like that. It looks like uh, a real faith and a real Savior, but it does not have to be detailed. Sure. Fair enough. Well, what about like, um, so the the idea that uh, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God and the Gospels of power of God and the salvation, uh, how does that relate to just the idea of some sort of elect infant um, scheme. So what you're criticizing is you're criticizing the idea that um, like in an Arminian kind of framework, there's no faith given whatsoever, right? Right. Yeah. So there's no faith given whatsoever. It's just um, like if you have a Pelagian scheme, you know, Pelagian scheme, if you have, um, you have some kind of, um, or even um, with some of our Calvinist kind of friends, like it seems like there's like a refusal to impute sin, Right. <laughs> Right. Right. So uh, you're criticizing those kind of views and you're arguing that, no, there needs to be like a faith kind of an, um, faith that's given. Right. F- faith is the instrument of justification that's given. So right. it, you can't skip that step. Uh, but then how does that relate to just, you know, some of the passages which, you know, typically describe how faith is given, you know, in that right. way? That is that is the normative means. Uh, how how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news because they are needed. Uh, without without someone preaching the gospel uh, under normative circumstances, no one would hear. However, given the examples we have in Scripture, like, for example, John the Baptist, who leaps with joy in his mother's womb in the presence of his Savior, uh, there is a category for God miraculously uh, imparting this knowledge to both children and others who are uh, unable to hear the external preaching of the word uh, to communicate to them whatever truth is necessary for them to believe that gospel that I described, you know, that, uh, that faith, even without all the specific details. Fair enough. And, uh, you know, I guess, um, you know, hearing you, hearing you talk about that, I guess there is a part of me. So I'll, I'll admit Conley that this is probably like the one part of your position that I have a hard time fully embracing, you know? Um, and you know, it, it's just, it's just because of, of passages like, like what we're talking about now where you Romans probably, 10. probably where, well, just these passages, passages in general that are, you know, like Jesus is telling us like, Hey, you know, go and make disciples. Right. Um, <laughs> you know, um, I think, um, God, you know, God tells us, or Paul tells us that we are allowed to partake in the ministry of reconciliation, right? God is, God's allowing us to partake in that. We, we don't, you know, there, we understand that, um, ultimately God is the one who is giving faith to people, right? So, so no individual can share the gospel with someone, have them come to salvation and then say, see, look what I did. Right. We, we all understand that it's God giving the faith there, but then it does seem, it does seem like, um, like at least the, yeah, like the normative way is to say, well, people come to salvation when they hear the word of God preached, right. When they hear the gospel preached and proclaimed. Um, and so, so it's, it's kind of hard to wrap my, wrap my head around, um, the idea that, that there are infants who God does save, not because I don't think he couldn't do it. I think he could. It just, I get, I have a harder time thinking that he actually says he does, does it anywhere. Right. I get right. Probably at best for me. Um, the, I think the closest I can get at least right now to, um, to your position is, is, uh, uh, possibly saying like, okay, you know, for John the Baptist, uh, for David, you have extremely, extremely specific circumstances 
that are, you know, um, that are heavily, I mean, they're, we're talking about prophecy being fulfilled here. You know, these are extremely significant, um, characters and, and the story of salvation, right. Uh, and God's plan of redemption, right. And they, they have a, they have very integral parts to play. And so God is, uh, God is treating them, you know, in a different way than he treats uh, those who are not a part of the of the specific prophecies he's fulfilling. So I think I think the closest I can get in my mind is there possibly to say, like, okay, John the Baptist, David, you know, obviously not Jesus. Jesus didn't need salvation. Uh, Maybe I can see that. But then I I have a hard time going to the, there are, you know, albeit, you know, probably few, right? Uh, There are others who are not significant characters in the, in the redemption narrative um, who, who are by the grace of God, given a, a given faith, even, even perhaps in the womb, right? Um, and and I guess part of what part of what makes it hard really to even accept that John the Baptist and David uh, were given you know faith from the womb is the fact that they actually did you know grow up. So so it's easy to say right. it's easy to look at that and say um, that was preparatory hey, for what right, they would do later. Right. Yeah. It, it's it's pre- uh, so like it's easy to say they're elect and. And God knows that they, these two particular people will grow up to be adults who can hear, you know, uh, hear well. And, and and I guess in both of their, well, for John the Baptist, you know, um, he's interacting with Jesus uh, and God has revealed what, who Jesus is to him. But then for David, he's just understanding that, like you're, like you said earlier, there is a Messiah he doesn't necessarily know, you know, the name of the person who would be the Messiah. Right. But then he understands there is a Messiah that will come from his line. Um, and so, so you have these two guys who are elect and they grow up to be adults who can understand the gospel. Um, and so, so I guess I'm just, I'm having a hard time coming to terms fully with, with that idea. Although I do think it is interesting uh, to think about. And I, ha- I haven't heard that position before that, that you're presenting. So, so what are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah. So I think I made it pretty clear in the last episode that I, I'm not positively stating that there are any in this era that have okay. been okay. saved in infancy. Right. Cause I think you had okay. asked me that and I had said, yeah, it might be that there have been none since John the Baptist. Okay. Um, I'm just saying that I do believe that John the Baptist is a case of salvation infancy. Therefore God is capable of it. Um, while I'm a cessationist and I don't believe in uh, continuing uh, gifts, I do think that uh, this falls under the realm of miracles that that could continue. And so, um, yeah, I have I have no reason to reject that this could still happen today. So that's that's kind of my position, which I think lines up with what you've been saying. There's just a. Uh, you know, maybe I'm coming off as stating more positively than I really am, you know, that there mm-hmm. aren't any in this era. Yeah. Um, I think, I think for me, uh, uh, probably where I'm at with it is, is more of the, like it, it could be possible, but I'm not sure I'm, I'm convinced that it, I'm, well, I mean, obviously God can do whatever he wants. I just mean like with what God has revealed to us, it could be possible, but I'm I'm not sure that it that it is even with John the Baptist I, and uh, David. I think the tension is um, the tension is related to you know how are they call them who they've not heard and how are they hear unless someone is sent. And so you, um, if you just absolutize that, don't treat it as normative, then you have a real struggle, you know, as it relates to these sorts of things. And you know, part of the point is I think part of the point of that passage is to like it feels like the point is to absolutize it like in that like how will they call on them who they've not heard the you know implied answer is no you know they won't you know so then it feels like it's meant to be that and then but then you really have to the only way to make to harmonize them then at that point is you have to treat the filling of the holy spirit at that point as functional so he's going to be filled from the holy spirit um 
from his mother's womb, like meaning appointed to ministry, uh, not necessarily in a salvific sense. And then, right. you know, and having the, the baby for joy is just, you know, uh, well, it could just be a sign at that point, or, I guess. Yeah. Well, it could be that God is in his sovereignty made the baby leap for joy. Yeah. It's not like a, a an understanding joy. It's just, yeah, it's, it's just, just joy. Like he just triggered that reaction to be a sign to Elizabeth to realize what's right. happening, you know? So and, and she's a, just calling it joy. <laughs> well, right. yeah, because it feels like joy in your stomach, yeah. your happy, well, but happy stomach. But, right. But she's filled with the spirit. So I, I take her statement about yeah. it as having more, you know, in, interpretive weight. Yeah. So then, well, yeah. So then you basically, um, ba- yeah. So then basically, um, you know, the, the way out is just to say, well, the other one's just a normative means, uh, overwhelmingly no, like the, um, how they call them unless they've heard and how they hear unless someone has sent then That's just treated as a overwhelmingly normative kind of, um, uh, right. in the absence of some sort of rare, rare, random, miraculous well, divine intervention. And that's, you know, yeah. we don't, we don't presume on God to do the miraculous. We content ourselves with the ordinary means, uh, that he's called us to do. It's right, and the way enough. the way I think about this too is that I'm not suggesting that uh, God does this in in frontier contexts where the gospel has not been given. I'm only talking about this in cases where the gospel has been given to an area and to a people, right? And then you have some people who are not capable of hearing. Well, a lot of right? people make the this Muslim is, context, Muslim kind of like uh, Jesus appearing to the Muslim personally kind of thing. Um, yeah, that's a yeah, that's a whole different issue. Um, but, uh, but yeah, can, um, yeah, does God reveal himself to those who, uh, have not even been, been reached by, you know, the preacher who Romans 10 is talking about, uh, yeah, maybe, you know, uh, I believe God can move in miraculous ways to prepare people for that gospel, but not, uh, but not like I'm talking about, you know, these, these stories I hear in those contexts, I'm more inclined to believe them when they don't include, uh, you know, someone one, like really seeing Jesus and, you know, receiving this gospel, et cetera. Cause, cause like you said, you know, it is, it is for the preachers to bring. It's, sure. All right. Well, maybe you can, um, you wrap us up here, uh, Conley and, um, give us, um, so thinking about the objections, maybe you can summarize the objections that, um, summarize the case that people are making for the universal salvation of infants. And then, you know, on both, like whether you're going like a Pelagian route, whether you're going a reformed route, maybe you can summarize the, the arguments they're making and then just give like a summary kind of, here's what I think is short-sighted about those. Does that make sense? Yeah. I right. think, I think almost everything we've looked at, almost everything comes down to basically saying that original sin is has no real power, right? Original guilt does not actually have the power of guilt and condemnation. And that's pr- pretty much everything boils down to. You think about, you know, Sam Storm's quotes that is he really the God that can condemn infants on no basis other than Adam's transgression? You know, is he really a God who would, who would count someone guilty on account of original guilt? You know, this is, this is what almost all of these arguments come back to. The idea of original, and a rejection of original guilt or the guilt, the, the verdict that, that corresponds to original guilt. <laughs> right. Is like that, the fact that it can actually make someone guilty, like it, you know, it makes them guilty in some sense, but not in the sense where it could actually be held against them in a court of law in God's divine court. And you, you attribute, uh, you would say that, you know, most of that is just, um, like how can, you know, good, you know, Calvinistic theologians, be so right. persuaded by, the, by this. Yeah, so, exactly. Well, that's the question I'm asking. If you're, you're supposed to answer that. Yeah. If, <laughs> how can they? <laughs> I, I don't know. I mean, the answer is emotional persuasion. You know, this is a very emotional topic. People really want to make a category for, you know, all infants going to heaven. And so they're willing to do, uh, you know, what they've got to do to make it happen. And I think that's probably another uh, set of what these objections are, is that infants are special. Like infants are very special to God and therefore he will save them. So like, for example, one verse uh, in Matthew 18, 14, it says, so it is not the will of my father who is in heaven that any of these little ones should perish. And so you see God's heart for children and 
then you say, okay, so if that's the case, if it's not his will, then he should perish, none do perish. But the problem is they do perish. Like we talked about this already, you know, uh, they do perish in this world. And so if that's not God's will, why does it happen? Because when it says it's not God's will that any should perish, it's talking about uh, his will in a particular kind of way, in a particular aspect. It's not saying that um, well, isn't it, it certainly weird? won't be the case that he's decreed otherwise. Well, isn't it weird that you have Psalms, I mean, related to that point, um, that were, I mean, in, you know, the Israelites are told to go into the promised land and dash the little ones on the rocks of judgment. And so then how do you... Like, I mean, I'm, I'm not embarrassed of those kind of passages. Right. But the only way you can make sense of, like, um, the people of God being means of judgment against the infants of a foreign nation is to have to, you have to have some category for original guilt in order to make sense of that. But then why would, why would it be any different to have a child, like an infant killed as a means of God's judgment? in a temporal way over and against an eternal way. Right. So right. what yeah, is the, exactly. what is the rationale? Like, wouldn't he be unjust to order that in the temporal realm? Right. Uh, but so not what the is the internal lo- realm? Yeah. Yeah. What is the, like, what is the rationale to say, because he's ordering it in the temporal realm yeah. right? And, and not just like natural. So you can't just blame it on natural evil. Right. So we talked about that with the, with our, um, but I think a lot of people do. I think a lot of people don't connect what happens to us in this life with sin. You know, they'll they'll take passages like Job. And I think I remember you talking about this on a recent episode. You know, they take passages like Job or the man born blind and they say that, OK, yeah, so, you know, bad things happen to good people. And, you know, they're they're God's just uh, as sorry about it as we are. Yeah, exactly. But but that's not the case. I mean, even with Job. And even with the man born blind, these were done so that the power of God might be displayed in them. Uh, these things were done for their uh, for their good to um, uh, to lead them in a particular way. It was because they were sinners and needed God's assistance in moving down that path of sanctification that he that he supplies these afflictions to his people. And for those who are not his people, once again, it is because of sin that he brings these things upon them. So in both cases, it's because of sin. I know that you looked into a lot of the church history stuff. So maybe this is a, like, do you have any quotes you want to bring up to um, round us out? Yeah, this is a, this is a great transition point because uh, one of the things that I found because a lot of people will misquote Calvin, and by misquote, I mean, you know, quote him out of context in ways where he looks like he's supporting a universal uh, salvation of infants, uh, where uh, one of the things I found is that, and unfortunately, I only have this in a uh, translation of a, of a Latin document that I don't have the whole document for, but the official charges that were brought up against Servetus that uh, Calvin led, they particularly point out that... Uh, and I'll just go ahead and uh, quote that. So this is this is uh, Calvin and 15 other Genevan pastors, um, excuse me, uh, 14 other Genevan pastors talking about Michael Servetus. Uh, he dare uh, he dare condemn none of the infant offspring of Ninevites or barbarians to hell, because in his opinion, a merciful Lord who hath freely taken away the sins of the godless would never so severely condemn those by whom no godless act has been committed and who are most innocent images of God. And further, he infers that all who are taken from life as infants and children are exempt from eternal death, though they be elsewhere called accursed. And so here you have one of the chief arguments against Servetus being that uh, when infants are talked about as being, you know, how happy is he who dashes their heads against the rocks, etc., that he would condemn none of them to hell. So you have this example of Calvin and... Uh, you know, there's plenty of examples of others, too, from that era, uh, you know, reformed reformed theologians who would all say at least the children of unbelievers, if not more than that, at least the children of unbelievers are are assigned to hell. Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think you can look at um, Augustine's confessions at the very least and, you know, him sin- confessing the sins of his infancy. And that would it um, that would be. Um, another example of a church father who would at least be um, at that point denying the you know, idea of age of accountability. 
Um, right. Because, you know, if there's not a age of accountability, you don't have to go back. Or if there's an age, you don't have to go back there. But uh, Yeah. And just, just thinking more about this idea that, um, you know, children are special in the eyes of God. Uh, and therefore, you know, if he doesn't want them to perish, they won't perish. Uh, where, when does that, when does that love go away? You know, if God loves these little children in such a way, when does he stop loving them that way? Is it around age five? Like, and then at five or 12, you know, he stops loving them and he does start dying that they perish. Like you, you have this weird kind of conditional love that God has for infants. If this is your, if this is your view of how he, well, you, how he thinks of children. Yeah. And it, you don't have any, um, like the only way to really make that make sense at all, if if there is that kind of special um, adoptive kind of love that he has for them, um, it, you really don't have a category for him acting in judgment upon them in history. You know, um, you, you basically have to. Like, I mean, like he could if he loved them like that, right? And he wanted to protect them from all judgment. It seems like they wouldn't die in general, right? Right. Then, yeah. Exactly. They wouldn't die in general, but then they wouldn't die um, as ob- 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 uh, objects of God's temporal judgment as well, right? Right, you, you, yeah. You, it, if he doesn't wish that they perish in any sense, then why do they perish in some sense? Why do they perish in some sense? Like, w- whether indirectly or directly or, you know, but it's all a part of his plan, right? And so I think the only way you really make sense of it is just to say that death is just something that, I guess, it must just be out of his control, right? Right. It, I mean, it's, it is that like the, the alternative? I mean, a lot of people we're talking about wouldn't go there, but that does seem to be the logical conclusion. It must just be he's just as sad as, you know, the tornado. Right. Death. His, hand, it, his hand is forced given, you know, the world we live in. Yeah. What, what, when he tells him to, like the Israelites to exterminate entire peoples, right? <laughs> his hand was forced. <laughs> I mean, at some point it's just like, well, maybe, maybe that's not a good place to go, you know? Uh, but then I guess apparently he just gets really mad at them after they, you know, get to seven years old or something. And is that basically right? Yeah, there's there's some point where that switch flips to where you have, you know, zero counting your guilt against you. And then suddenly, oh, yes. Yeah, it definitely. It definitely feels like, um, you know, like like with so many other other things that people make mistakes on when it comes to theology and, and what God has actually told us. Um, a lot of times it, it does seem like people don't really take the things that they believe and then think them all the way through to their logical conclusion. But then, yeah, I, I think part of, part of what led me to, you know, my position on all of this is just thinking about some of those questions and then just saying, you know, asking myself like, okay, yeah, what, what's the age then, you know, like how do we even know that seems like something that we should probably, that God should probably have told us, you know, if we're going to, you know, if I'm going to raise my children, right, then I, I would like to know when's the, you know, when, at what age are they all of a sudden like, all right, now I need to really be careful that I make sure they don't die. Cause, <laughs> cause now, you know, if they die, they're going to go to hell and, and they weren't before. And, and, and I think there's just so many questions like that, that are, that lead you to weird answers that don't seem to align with God's character and his nature that have that have you know pushed me to to the position that i i just don't think that you know um i think you know maybe perhaps like john the baptist and david are special circumstances or something but then you know the majority of children i just i think that they get held to the same judgment that everyone else gets held to and so um i i i think i think that's kind of a good place to end on that the idea of like, all right, take them to their logical conclusions and, and they just don't, it, they just don't work. They, they lead you to weird conclusions that I don't think we would make in any other circumstance, uh, on, or any other topic or talking about any other type of people, you know, we, we don't come to these conclusions, but then we want to, when it comes to children. So, um, Conley, you've done you you've been so brave man you you've done two episodes now <laughs> you you've been uh you've been uh, Bruce Jenner transitioning brave uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's high praise right there 
So brave, uh, yeah, brave, stunning. And, stu- <laughs> brave and stunning. You've been no, you've brave been real, and stunning. You've been, you've been real, the real brave, not just the fake. Yeah. Brave. Well, maybe I'll find it. Maybe I'll regret it after I start getting emails after this episode. I don't know. <laughs> well, we we didn't ta- we didn't tag your email on the last one, so. People uh, will if, find it. They'll find yeah, a way. <laughs> they'll, they'll find a way. But, um, you gotta, no. I don't know. Any Facebook post or anything, you've got to tag me in them so I can see the, the things people are saying in response. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, yeah, no, no, we really are appreciative of you being willing to come on and talk about this. Um, because like, like we said last time, this, this is important. Anytime you talk about salvation, we need to, we need to, you know, we, that, I mean, that's one of the core, you know, um, uh, aspects of Christianity as salvation. And so we really need to commit ourselves to understanding what it is God said when it comes to these things, because there's so many implications that come from it. But, um, before we go, I didn't get, I, I forgot to do this last time. Um, but I want to make sure I do it this time is Conley, uh, before, before we get off, uh, why don't you go ahead and just, you know, uh, tell everyone who's listening, where can they find more of you? What are you working on right now? Sure. This is the part so, where you leave your email address so that yeah. people can. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, like I said, people can easily find it if they want. But I'm a pastor at Silicon Valley Reformed Baptist Church, so you can check out our church at svrbc.org. And then uh, also, please check out the episode I did earlier with Bible Bashed um, on the Dorian Principle. Uh, it was about uh, the commercialization of Christianity. I have a book called The Dorian, Pr- uh, the Dorian Principle. A biblical response to the commercialization of Christianity, and you can check that out at uh, thedorianprinciple.org. Yeah, and and that's a um, that's a free book, right? It's a, it's you can order it, you can read it online, and it's an audio book, right? That's correct. Yeah, it's uh, it's in a lot of different formats: EPUB, Kindle, PDF, uh, just right on the website, and yeah, and also an audio book. And there's also a Facebook group. I'd really love it if more people join the Facebook group. It's called uh, Money and Ministry. And so, yeah, we talk about the commercialization of Christianity there. Um, you know, Jesus said freely, you received, freely give, but so many ministries are trying to sell you things rather than uh, freely giving. Right. Okay. Well, again, thank you for coming on the show. And uh, we want to you know, take time, too, to thank all of you guys who are listening uh, for the ways that you support us. For the ways that you interact with us, that's a ton of fun to get to talk with you guys and, and comment back and forth on some of these things and and hear your perspective and and um, you know what your positions are on the various things that we talk about and you know our whole goal is is to be able to equip you guys for the works of ministry by answering the questions you're not allowed to ask and and you know I personally I think that's a ton of fun and. And it's fun to get to hear from back from a lot of you guys and hear how, you know, hey, you, you like you like talking you're hearing from people who are willing to say these things. And, and Conley, you've definitely proven that you're willing to you, you're your Bible bashed material, man. <laughs> your Bible bashed material. And so uh, so thank you, Conley. Thank you for all you guys that listen and we'll catch you on the next one. This has been another episode of Bible Bashed. We hope you have been encouraged and blessed through our discussion. We thank you for all your support and ask you to continue to like and subscribe to Bible Bashed and share our podcast with your friends and on social media. Please reach out to us with your questions, pushback, and potential topics for us to discuss in future episodes at BibleBashedPodcast at gmail.com and consider supporting us through Patreon. If you would like to be Bible Bashed personally, then please know that we also offer free biblical counseling, which you can take advantage of by emailing us. Now, go boldly and obey the truth in the midst of a biblically illiterate world who will be perpetually offended by your every move.